Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of Vietnam. In our previous lecture, we explored more deeply America's growing interest and involvement in Vietnam as the Cold War deepened in the years after World War II. In previous lectures, we had talked about the latter stages of the French rule in Vietnam, ending with the dismal defeat at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu and then the Geneva Peace Accords. You might recall that as part of those Geneva Accords, Vietnam was to be divided north and south temporarily in 1954, ending in 1956 when a national election was intended to unify the country. Let's pick up the story again, beginning with a closer look at the man that the Americans decided would be their candidate to win those elections in 1956, Wo Dinh Diem. In 1954, following the Geneva Accords, Washington selected a man named Wo Dinh Diem to head the South Vietnamese government. Diem was born in 1901, the son of a wealthy member of the former imperial court. He was Catholic went to law school in Hanoi, performed brilliantly, and rose quickly in the provincial government. Diem offered an attractive combination to the Americans. He was an ardent nationalist first. He hated the French for imposing their domination, and he opposed the communists, whom he suspected were not sincere in their nationalism. He worked for a time under Bao Dai, but grew frustrated when his policies and ideas were not accepted, and he himself was never truly accepted by the French. He resigned and retreated from public service until tapped by the Americans in 1954. In 1951, he traveled to America and campaigned for Vietnamese independence. He traveled widely, speaking at colleges and to various politicians, and began to develop a name for himself. As the Americans planned to replace the French in Vietnam, in search of a candidate to replace Bao Dai, they settled on Diem. They knew he wasn't perfect. He lacked public support, and he wasn't well known in Vietnam. He was relatively inexperienced. He had an odd personality, and as we'll see moving forward, he ultimately became unreliable, and some might say he even went crazy. In June of 1954, at the urging of the Americans, Bao Dai appointed Diem Premier of South Vietnam. Bao Dai remained on as Emperor, but was merely a figurehead. Diem found that the government he had been assigned to lead was rickety at best. It was inefficient and included much corrupt bureaucracy. The army was demoralized and of questionable loyalty and the capital city was divided and chaotic. With the elections to be held in only two years, it was expected that Diem might very well lose. He was something of a lame duck even before he began. Throughout this period, the French were still nominally in control in Vietnam, but the Americans moved to circumvent them. They began sending aid directly to Diem and his offices, rather than to French officials. Diem was able to survive these early difficulties and trials, in part by aid from U.S. Air Force Colonel Edward G. Lansdale, who headed a CIA group sent to advise Diem. Lansdale worked against Diem's political opponents by threatening to cut off all U.S. aid if they didn't support Diem, and those opponents began to begrudgingly support him. He also helped advise Diem in handling a massive migration of people from North Vietnam. During the initial period after Geneva, both sides resettled. Hundreds of thousands of people came south, most of them Catholics. The United States hoped that these refugees would offer a base of support for Diem, and also they were a compelling image of the Cold War. The United States media played up the pictures of millions fleeing from communism. Lansdale's CIA agents encouraged the migration. They dropped leaflets encouraging them to leave the north and provided ships and transportation to bring them south. Several hundred thousand came south by these methods. 
these Catholics from the north became an important part of Diem's political base, which had been slim at best. In return, many of them were given appointments in the Diem government. Lansdale's team also smuggled in radios, arms, and supplies for Diem's troops. Diem further encountered problems in the spring of 1955, when he continued to try to consolidate control of his government. He confronted opposition from a number of powerful and influential groups. Among these groups was the Bin Tsuin, headed by Bei Vien, centered in Jalan, a Chinese suburb of Saigon. This was essentially a mafia-like operation, controlling an underworld empire. Under Bao Dai's government, the Bin Tsuin provided large bribes and payoffs to carry out their activities unchecked. They had an army of some 25,000 people. Bao Dai even appointed Bei Vien as the chief of the national police with authority over gambling, prostitution, and opium traffic, even as he traded in these very same things. Diem also faced an uprising from the Buddhists in South Vietnam. There were two major sects among the Buddhists. The Cao Dai sect, which blended traditional Buddhist and Christian beliefs with a worship of films. Believers prayed to Buddha, Confucius, Jesus Christ, and Charlie Chaplin. By the early 1950s, this sect claimed about 2 million followers and an army of 25,000 troops. The other major sect was the Hoa Hao, which similarly blended traditional themes, but in this case with the worship of Vietnamese nationalist heroes. They claimed about 1.5 million followers and about 15,000 troops. All of these groups had enjoyed relative autonomy under the French and in fact had opposed the Viet Minh during the Indochina War. They were accustomed to French rule and thus opposed Diem and didn't support him. In the spring of 1955, these three powerful opposition groups united in an attempt to overthrow Diem. But Diem moved quickly to try to stop this rebellion. He first attacked Bei Vien and the Bin Suin. He sent the army into the streets of Kalan, attacking members of the Bin Suin, raiding brothels and opium dens. Eventually, Bei Vien was forced to flee out into the countryside. To appease the Buddhist sects, Lansdale himself intervened. He approached members of both sects and bribed them, ultimately paying them about $12 million to drop their opposition of Diem. Many, in fact, became members of Diem's army. By mid-1955, Diem was firmly in charge in the south, had overcome his rivals, and controlled his army. Nonetheless, a report from a U.S. official in Saigon at that time reflects the future of the Yam government. This man was named General Collins, and he wrote, I still feel that even if Yam manages to suppress the Bin Suin, this will not change his own basic incapacity to manage the affairs of government. I am still convinced Diem does not have the knack for handling men, nor the executive capacity truly to unify the country and establish an effective government. If this should be evident, we should either withdraw from Vietnam because our money will be wasted, or we should take steps as can be legitimately taken to secure an effective new premier. With no obvious alternative apparent, Eisenhower and Dulles continued to back GM. With GM in control, and with the backing of the Americans, the French completed their withdrawal. In March of 1956, the last of the French troops left Saigon, ending nearly 100 years of colonial rule. GM also got rid of Bao Dai, who was still the nominal emperor under the French. In October 1955, Diem called for a referendum, which was highly corrupt, and claimed a 98% victory. Bao Dai was unseated. Diem proclaimed himself the head of state of the Republic of Vietnam. 
Tim was charged with overseeing a very diverse and contentious population. In addition to the two Buddhist sects and the Bin Suin, there were members of the Viet Minh, estimated to number about a million during this period. There were traditional Buddhist monks, spread widely throughout the region, who did not look to either Saigon or Hanoi for political guidance, but who preached village autonomy. They just didn't like interference from the outside. There were also ethnic divisions. There were estimated to be about one million Chinese living in the region. There were about 600 Khmer, ethnic Cambodians, who resented the Vietnamese for their conquest of that group. And the Montagnards, a polyglot group living in the hills and jungles, among Catholics as well. It would have taken a political genius to successfully lead all these diverse groups. And Diem was no political genius. In our next lecture, we'll continue this discussion of the various groups in Vietnam and opposition to Diem and how he addressed it.